Good morning, everyone. My name is Randall from Randall's ESL Cyber Listening Lab, providing tips on language learning, culture, and human development. I want to welcome you to the broadcast today and a happy new year. And to get started, just so you're aware, I use a platform called StreamYard. So anytime during the broadcast, you can be sharing your comments. I will try to post those comments on the stream so that people can see them because the reality is, with a live broadcast, the only reason why you would want to come to one is if you have the opportunity to fully engage in the conversation, and I'm hoping to do that so today. So let me go ahead and uh, get into the broadcast. What I'd like to talk about is a little bit, uh, number one, about some of the things that I've been doing over the last couple of years, and uh, just kind of, let's say, a walk in the park to kind of talk about some of the past but also some of the things that I'm doing right now that are ideas that are relevant to you. So in other words, I don't want to just talk about myself, but I also want to talk about things that could apply to you. And I'm specifically speaking about AI technologies. Now, you probably recognize my voice. It's not 100% today, but I wanted to go ahead with the broadcast anyway. Why not? So uh, let me give you an update uh, next week. I will have a Jaime Ankahima uh, from the University of Piura in Peru. He's going to be joining me on the broadcast, and he's going to be talking about his professional activities, development activities over the last number of years. And I think that you'll find that really engaging. Jaime and I met, I think it was at the beginning of 2020 during the pandemic, and uh, we just have hit off, uh, started a relationship, and I've been a real admirer of his work in professional development online. So uh, let me go ahead and begin. And uh, again, what I'm going to talk is briefly about the development of websites over the last 25 years, but then get into uh, more emphasis on AI technologies, the technologies that I'm currently using, and you might be interested in using as well. So question is, what were some of your favorite websites back in the 1990s, the 2000s? Or what about some of the websites that you enjoy using today? Certainly, there has been a great evolution and what we've seen over the last few years. And even for me, I started my website back in 1997. I was living in Japan at the time. But we can see radical changes in the landscape of technology, uh, bandwidth, audio video formats. I'm gonna show you some examples, uh, website platforms, uh, smartphones and other devices. And to give you an idea what I'm meaning by this, uh, oh, and here's a question coming in. Thank you, AI technologies are a novelty. Thanks for sharing. I'm gonna be talking about those today. So let me go ahead and uh, I'm gonna play a short clip an audio clip, and I want to see if any of you recognize what the sound is. Listen carefully. Here we go. What is that? <laughs> I, I think that's all I need to play with that. Certainly, do you recognize that sound? And yeah. That is the actual dial-up modem, very common in the 1990s, connecting to the internet, you know, well before broadband connections. And so, so many things have evolved over the last few years that have really caused us to reflect on what we do and how we do things. So, when I think back, you see, uh, here is a screenshot of my website, what it looked like about 1998. And... Uh, when you think about the changes in technologies, number one, just the appearance. Back then, we were doing everything with raw HTML coding. Uh, and uh, it's really wasn't very responsive to different platforms and even browsers. Linear, uh, limited interconnectivity. Uh, on this particular example that I'm showing you, yeah, basically, it is a quiz. Students select a, an answer. It's using JavaScript. <laughs> Excuse me. But it didn't have any of the functionality that we often see today. 
with uh, adaptive learning platforms that use logic reasoning. In other words, you answer a question and then it takes you to a different page or a different answer where you can actually learn and the actual assessment adapts based on your uh, particular abilities and so forth. The other idea that I think has changed a lot is uh, with the video and audio quality. I mean, it has drastically changed. And right now, I want to show you a short video clip that was on my website around 1999. And you'll notice it's very pixelated, but just kind of compare that to what we see today. Oh, let me bring that up. Dog Lucky. Uh, the fire broke out at the three-story building behind me. Uh, Very unfortunately, we're not able to get any closer because the possibility of an explosion. Uh, however, witnesses say that they noticed fire coming from the building earlier this morning. It was believed. All right, so you can kind of get a sense of what audio and video quality look like. And so we were really limited by the types of things that we could actually implement back in that period of time. And the other thing is, is that virtual phones, as we know them today, I mean, uh, mobile devices and smartphones, it really didn't exist uh, in the idea of being able to connect online. Now, you know, my website went on again around 1998, and that was before, that was the same year that Google came online, before Facebook, before Instagram, before TikTok. I'm not suggesting in any way that my website is more prominent, not at all. But the technologies, uh, including YouTube, have really evolved over time. Uh, yes, I may. And in that video, that was me. That was uh, uh, an earlier version of Randall. So with that in mind, one of the things I want to ask you, be thinking about what are some of if, if you were uh, teaching or even studying back in the 1990s or early 2000s, what are some of the things that you've noticed in website design and change and, and uh, design and content that have been most beneficial to you? Feel free to post that. Uh, and so that, I think that's really uh, important and key. Another thing is, is that keeping in mind, and let me go on, is that since the 1990s, so many other things have really happened in the design of websites. And of course, back in the 1990s, you did have uh, you know, web servers, but over time, as uh, the need for uh, greater bandwidth for audio and video, then you saw around 1998, uh, CDNs, which are content delivery networks. So often when you think about a server, often we call that the origin server. Back you know, in the 1990s, often audio and video files and web pages will pull directly from that server. In other words, if your server was in Chicago and your a learner or visitor was in Australia, actually, when they made a request to see that particular web page, it was calling it. It sent a request all the way to Chicago and then it sent the audio back or the file back, which really created a lot of latency. But with the development of more video and audio, now content delivery networks are basically uh, a geographically located servers around the world that have copies of the files from your origin server. So you might have uh, your origin server is in Chicago, but you have a visitor in Tokyo, and there might be a server in this network that is pulling the files not from Chicago, but from, from Tokyo or that area. And the only reason I bring that up is that as you see greater and greater a need for bandwidth and video and audio, a lot of different technologies are needed. Content management platforms are, are becoming really important. Uh, also, data database management systems. So all of these things are really key to the development of websites, which often makes it really challenging. So... Um, the one thing I want to talk about and then lead into AI technologies is the idea, and this is actually a slide from a presentation I did many years ago. And often you always want to keep in mind that just because you can do it with technology doesn't mean it should be done. In other words, you often want to come with a concept and then <clears throat> excuse me, find ways of blending 
technology and pedagogy because often less is more. And so just once again, just because you can do it with technology doesn't need, doesn't necessarily mean it should be done. So over the years, what I've tried to do is I've tried to, again, adapt some of the things that I'm doing on the internet. Uh, and I think some of the ideas that I'm going to talk about now are going to be relevant to everyone. There are two particular sections of my website uh, that I started last year, uh, English interviews and life stories. And what I decided to do, you know, when you think about chat GPT back in November of 2022, you know, people think that in some cases that uh, AI technology started then, but actually no, I mean, AI technologies go back decades and you might be using a website like Netflix or Amazon or Google, which rely on AI technologies and not even know it. So what I tried to do is I thought, okay, what can I, as part of today's presentation, is talk briefly about some of the things that I'm doing, but also how could this be relevant to you who are developing materials and content? So these are the two sections of my website I've been working on, but let's talk about um, AI technologies in general. And feel free to post any comment, again, about what your general feelings about the benefits and drawbacks in using technologies in our daily lives. Again, Facebook, uh, the platform I'm using right now, which is called StreamYard, it's using AI technologies, but how has AI affected your classroom in a general sense and your teaching? Uh, feel free to share any comments. The next idea what I want to share is I want to share four different AI technologies that I have used that you might find maybe useful for you. Now, uh, one of the things that people often ask me is about price, price points. And yes, different AI technologies, some are free like ChatGPT, but there are other AI technologies that I'm going to show to you that you might decide whether it fits your price point or not? Does it help expedite your work or not? And so sometimes the actual price point of different AI technologies depends on whether you're using it privately, whether you're using it for an educational purpose, or whether you're using it commercially. But all of the ones that I'm sharing with you, StreamYard and Sonics and an AI voice generator, each one of those probably cost between 20 to $30 a month. And you would need to decide, is it really worth it? So let me describe some of these and maybe these might spawn some ideas for you. The one thing I want to say very, very clearly is that on my website, and I think any teacher who is developing materials using AI technologies, I think it's important to have some level of intellectual and ethical transparency. So what I'm doing on my particular websites, I'm using in a collaborative way, both my experience and also AI technologies blended. And then on the pages that I actually use AI technologies, I tell people that. I think it's important to be clear and transparent in all that you do. So with this in mind, let me talk about several different ideas. You might find they're useful. Uh, each one of these, certainly, we could go into greater detail, um, and uh, that's not necessarily my purpose today, but I want to address them in part. First of all is a service called Sonics, and Sonics is a speech-to-text transcription uh, software. It's an online web-based uh, platform. There are many of these, but the idea is, imagine, for example, you have a YouTube video and you want to do an automatic transcription. Now, I know that YouTube has its own uh, functionality in this way. But the nice thing about Sonics is, is it allows you to take any audio file, any video file, YouTube and so forth, and create a transcription. Now, the one thing I like about this is that when you go to many websites, including my website, where you click on an audio button and then they, you listen to the audio, there is no real ability to manipulate, to slow down the audio, to actually click on a, a word or a transcription and listen to that word again and again and again. So one of the things that I'm experimenting with just right now 
is Sonics, where it has an embedded player. So I take an audio file, I transcribe it. Then as the student is reading, is listening, they have the option of actually having that transcription scroll down the page. And then you can follow along in any word at any point you want to listen again, you just click on it and it will repeat it. And uh, it also you have the ability of variable speed control. Uh, comments coming in, benefits are countless. Thank you for mentioning it. Uh, brings back variety, breaks monotony, make class more enjoyable and drawbacks risk the thinking abilities of teachers. So I want to talk about that also in conjunction. Uh, can it make students and teachers lazy? And so let me describe what I've done and then decide on whether it could be of a benefit to you. So AI, again, Sonics is a great program. Uh, again, that um, could be very useful for teachers who want really clear, concise transcription of any audio or video. And whether you embed it on your website or not, that's up to you. So that's something I'm experimenting with. The next thing is another section of my website is called video interviews. And uh, for many, many years, starting back in 1998 to 1999, uh, some of my children joined in on the conversations. You probably can hear if you go to the easy, intermediate and advanced sections, you can listen to my children's voices when they were four years old, six years old, eight years old. And uh, those were very extemporaneous. They were not scripted in any way. But over time, as my children, now all of my children are adults now, I wanted to do something new. I wanted to use different adult voices, voices that weren't scripted once again, but create them with a greater focus on critical thinking. Now, critical thinking is a really a common term that we often hear. But one of the things when I think about critical thinking, as you can see on the point in the slide, is that really what we want to try to do, and if we drill down to what critical thinking means, it means creating and helping students have a critical and inquisitive mindset, a growth mindset, allows them to reflect on their own beliefs currently, it helps them synthesize information. And another thing is skeptical inquiry. Do they ask themselves? about their current beliefs or thoughts on any particular issue, and are they willing to unlearn? And what I mean by that, some of my favorite books are called Being Wrong. Another book is called Blind Spots. Another one is called Idiot Brain. Another one is called Think Again. And so all of these ideas, what I'm trying to encourage students using different technologies, and let me show this again, is to help them develop those type of skills. So let me show you an example of a video that I created with my two daughters, and then I'll talk about how I've integrated AI and combined it with my own experience. So let me bring this up. This video is called, it's again, it's on my website. It's called, Is It Okay to Lie? Is it okay to lie? And let me set up a story here to begin with. I know when you two were growing up, uh, there was a time where we pretended that Santa Claus e existed. Oh, for anyone that is watching that still believes, you might want to mute this, turn this off. I don't want to have any spoilers or ruin your day. I think we're clear now. And uh, there, was a time, <laughs> there was a time when I told you that Santa Claus existed. Uh, and I know there are other stories of how you found out that he didn't, but are there times when telling a lie is okay? Yes or no? Here comes the ideas. I think it's super situational. Uh, okay. For example, my son is terrified of monsters and he has this kind of spooky closet that in his room that really makes him nervous at nighttime. And so we have monster detectors in our house and that's a lie we absolutely don't they're little things that you put into the outlet that are supposed to make bugs go away but he thinks that they're detecting monsters i think i built work. something similar you did do something similar that's where i got the idea was so what I try to do, and I was making reference to this, is when I create an audio recording, 
for like one of these videos. And then what I do is plug in the transcript for the video. I use Sonics. I create the transcript. I take that transcript. Then I actually plug that in to uh, ChatGPT. And then I can tell ChatGPT, please create several different questions. And let me bring up uh, some of these ideas that actually cause students to reflect on your thoughts and uh, your current ideas. I download the transcript. I plug that into ChatGPT. And then I can tell ChatGPT to do anything. For example, if I'm looking at critical thinking, and again, critical thinking is a very broad concept. What do we actually mean by critical thinking? And as I just mentioned, synthesizing information. I can tell ChatGPT to uh, create critical thinking questions that will prompt students to reflect on their current belief systems about lying. Is it okay to lie? And in that video, we talk about all types of situations, including I asked my daughters, what if I were dying? Would you want me to tell you the truth? And, and they, they really go into depth about what they think and what they feel. So I think chat GPT in conjunction with their own abilities, I think is uh, really critical to a growth mindset. So that's how I use ChatGPT in conjunction with an existing video. And again, even if you don't have your own website, let's say there is a, um, a website that or a YouTube video that you find useful or an audio recording from your class, you could actually plug that into Sonics if you don't want to type out the entire transcript. And then what you can do is take the transcript plug that in to chat GPT. And then with any type of prompt, you can say, please come up with um, 10 different critical thinking questions based on easy, medium, and intermediate and advanced level questions. So it's a way for, for at least for me, collaborative along with chat GPT and other technologies to actually rethink, try to create different ideas on how I can elicit uh, discussion from them. I don't think that takes away from my ability to think and process. It just gives me another tool, another tool in my toolbox, you could say, to create that new content. So that's what I do with the video interviews. The next part I want to talk about is the other section on my website, and this is called Life Stories. And this is where I combine two different AI technologies. One is an AI a voice generator. I'm going to share some examples of that in a couple of minutes. And uh, chat GPT. So what I wanted to do, in addition to some of the different activities that I've created on my website, I wanted to create engaging stories that would, uh, on a variety of different topics, that would cause students to think, rethink. Uh, they could be about business. They could be about travel. They could be about language learning. And then what I would do is, and again, you can do this in different ways. Number one, you can write up your own transcript if you would like, no problem at all. Often what I do is with ChatGPT, I plug in a particular topic or theme and I ask ChatGPT to create a story based on that. Now, once again, and I mentioned earlier in the broadcast, for complete transparency, on all of the pages that I use AI technologies, I clearly state that. I never want to give anyone the impression that any of the things that are using AI technologies were mine alone. And I don't think there's a problem with that as long as you give reference to that clearly in the content you're creating. But also what I do in addition to these stories, I have pre-listening activities, uh, Here's an example of activities that I've created uh, that are based on different modalities, uh, whether it's an auditory learner, a visual learner, a tactile learner. And so I also have a conversation question thing about chat GPT is that you can actually pro, uh, plug in a transcript and tell it to create 10 multiple choice questions um, and uh, with an answer key and explanations at the end. There's certainly different things that you can do in that way as well. But also one of the things I wanted to do is I wanted to add voices to my own voice and the other voices of uh, my family. Now, there's certainly you could ask colleagues to do the recordings and so forth, but there are limitations. For example, if you're in an environment where you want a um, an accent from 
Australia, you want from the United States or from England, and you don't have those resources to, you know, hire voice talents. What there are different types of uh, AI voice generators that will create, that will convert written text to human-like speech. And in a minute, I'm going to talk about what are some of the benefits to that. But I just want you to listen to an example. Again, there you're going to hear three voices. Uh, two women and a man. Again, what I did is I asked ChatGPT to create a short introduction on Randall, and then I actually plugged in the script into the voice generator. I'm going to talk about some examples in a minute. So listen to that. Can you really tell that this was AI? And I think it is ultra -real realistic. So let's go ahead and listen to this. It's very short, but listen to the sample. Two women's voices and then a man's voice. Hello everyone. Today we're thrilled to introduce you to an innovative content creator who's revolutionizing online learning. His name is Randall Davis and he's leveraging various AI technologies to craft engaging and dynamic content specifically tailored for language teachers and learners. <laughs> and if you haven't guessed it yet, we're not real people, but simply ultra realistic voices created using an advanced AI voice generator and Randall can make me say anything he wants to make him look good. Thank you. I, I like his smirk at the end. So one of the things when you keep that in mind is that, wow, I could take a, a story that I've already created, something that I've generated in, in let's say chat uh, GPT and using a voice generator. And uh, one of the things that I want to talk about is, well, why use an AI voice generator? Here are some ideas. Now, keep in mind that an AI voice generator, some are free, but they don't have ultra realistic voices. But let's talk about some of the potential benefits, especially if you're in the language program where you really require or need a variety of different voices. So number one, variety. I mean, like let's say today, my voice is not at peak performance. Well, I certainly could create a clone of my voice. Now we all realize the potential uh, negative aspects of cloning your own voice. But when you have an AI voice generator, you can have ultra realistic voices in different languages, even different accents, uh, flexibility. You can take a, a voice and then with the same voice, you can create different inflections, a happy, a surprised an excited voice. But one of the biggest things is time and cost efficiency. I mean, when you think about this, the nice thing about an AI voice generator, if you're not using one and you record it and you realize that you need to change three words in the middle of the conversation, well, then what you have to do is you have to go into your editing software, edit it and so forth. And that's really, really hard. But with an AI voice generator, all you need to do is in the generator, you paste in the text, and then you just change two or three words, and then you regenerate the audio. And the other thing is, is cost efficiency, saving money on voice actors. Uh, yeah, you might be able to get people that will record that on their own, that are willing to do that for you, just for full tra transparency. With my adult children on any of the videos that they do for me, I pay them because I think their talents are well worth it. Uh, I think they add a great deal to my website, but there are also times where, wow, because of time savings in production costs, because of cost efficiency, AI technologies are, I think, really, really beneficial. And Jaime, yeah, one of the things, there are many of these services that you can see, Murph and Lovo and so forth, Play HT, all of these generally have a trial period where I think it's worth testing out to see if it could benefit you. Now, does that mean I won't do any more of my own recordings? No, I'm, I'm constantly doing that with my children and other uh, productions. So I will continue to do that. But if I need different voices, a female voice from Australia, I can use an AI generator to do that. Again, general costs are probably between probably between $20 to $30 a month. And again, I'm not saying that is very cheap for different people. Uh, that could be very costly. Uh, but if you're working in a program and you need, 
you know, people to help you in audio recordings and they don't have the time or, and so forth, using an AI generate can really be a, a benefit. But the question is, which would you recommend? Thank you, Maya. Uh, there are a variety of them. These are all the ones that I've experimented myself and uh, each have slightly different features. Uh, sometimes a lower tier plan, let's say $9.95 a month or whatever the price is, will allow you to do that for personal use. If you want it for commercial use, you might pay $25 a month. But for me, the time savings and the variety of different voices could certainly make it worth it. And the other thing is really interested in voice cloning. Yes, there are many services that will do that for you. And what could it be the benefit for you Let's say uh, you know, you're trying to recreate some recordings or you're working in a company or in a school and you want the teacher or the headmaster or the principal or head professor to give an introduction to students and he's not available. You could actually, with permission, create a clone voice and then create a recording of him saying whatever you want. So certainly AI technology. So that is in the way that I'm using it on Life Stories. I would take a look. And again, I think that with ChatGPT as an example and some of these services right here, they can really revolutionize what you're doing. I, again, I don't believe it takes place of every type of recording you might want to create, not at all. And again, I think the ability and someone might ask, well, can you create partner, like a dialogue? Yeah, you can do that. that. That is certainly possible. So going back to the question, which would you recommend? There are so many, and you might be looking for a particular one. I'm showing the ones that I would recommend. And just so you know, right after this broadcast, I'm going to post this PowerPoint on, uh, on uh, Facebook and uh, probably in different locations so that, oh, Randall, what was that particular service that you were talking about? So you'll have access to that. So I'm going to post this certainly on Facebook uh, so that people can have this documentation and reference. Which among the list performs voice, voice cloning? Uh, PlayHT does, uh, Murph a AI does. But the, the challenge is, is that they're constantly evolving. So I might quote you a price and two days from now, they've changed and adjusted. Or that some of the services in the past uh, did not provide voice cloning as a part of your package, but more and more of them are including that now. So I might say, oh, you might want to use PlayHT because it has voice cloning and others do not. And then you realize two days from now that others do. So I would suggest for any of these services to sign up uh, and, uh, you know, test them out and see. But I'm listing ones that I've tr at least tested before. Uh, oh, here's an, a question here. My, uh, they would be a great tool for non-native speaking teachers. Absolutely. And that's one of the th reasons why I'm bringing this up is that when there are cases where you want and you don't have access to, uh, to native speakers. And again, we all agree that non-native speakers can be wonderful models of language learning. Absolutely. But if you want a variety of different voices, certainly it, it makes that difference. So Maya, thanks for bringing that up. I think uh, I mentioned a little bit about voice cloning as well uh, and so forth. Uh, keep asking any questions you might have. So the reality is, okay, Randall, you mentioned a little bit about how you've used AI technologies, specifically AI in your section on life stories. How could we use it? So if I if we were to take chat GBT and we used a, a an AI voice generator, what are some of the things that we could actually do in our own plan? Uh, classes. And this is going back to Maya, your particular uh, idea and thought. Any type of learning activity that you might be doing or requiring some type of voice could be used. Uh, listening activities, pronunciation tasks, uh, story readings. Uh, you need an example of a debate. All of those are real and possible. And again, going back to some of the reasons that I just mentioned, let me step back here for a minute. Whoops, uh, that was these ideas. Variety of voices, flexibility. Again, you can take one voice, let's say it's Donald, and you can actually change his voice fluctuations to emphasize a, a narrative style or an advertising style, and cost efficiency. So when you think about, okay, maybe some of these services are maybe $25 a month, but 
if you were to, for example, at your school or institution, get a group plan, certainly that's an option. But uh, I really appreciate the flexibility that it gives me to create different things. Um, course introductions. Let's say that you have an online course and you want to introduce that course to students in an audio format. Language assessments. Oh, this is one of the biggest areas where you're, you know, in class, you might have an audio recording or or so from uh, from your book and so forth, but you want to create based on certain vocabulary, grammatical structures that were in the listening and speaking book, you can use chat GPT and say, create a, uh, a story, 300 words long, include uh, three multiple choice questions uh, and an answer key, uh, fill in the blank answers or whatever you want to. And then you can plug in that script into an AI voice generator uh, to really enhance what you're trying to do. Uh, virtual campus tours, you're introducing students to your campus, welcome messages on school website and social media content. All of those, I think, are exciting possibilities that really can enhance what you do. And that probably all of you can be thinking about, oh, I didn't think about that. Oh, here's another way that I could use it. And so the idea is, at least for me, Randall, what is next for you coming in 2024 that could be relevant to other teachers? Well, one of the things I'm going to continue to expand on the video interviews with my children. I think those are really interesting. And again, with each video interview, there are comprehension questions. There's a speaking, a critical thinking discussion questions. There are language games all built around the uh, content in the video. And uh, so I'm going to continue to do those. I'm going to experiment with new AI technologies. I, you know, You blink and something else has come up. I think that is constant, what we see. And then I'm going to continue the live broadcast like this. I really enjoy meeting teachers in this kind of format where teachers can share their ideas, post their comments. And again, the one benefit of having like a video production like this is that you can share in the questions and uh, the topic. Otherwise, you could just watch the video later on, you know, on demand and so forth. So those are some of the things that I'm planning on doing uh, throughout this uh, particular year. Oh, uh, another idea. So are there any for gamification? Now, Maya, I'm not sure exactly what you mean if you're talking about AI technologies. But one of the things that I've noticed is that with ChatGPT, it's a really cool feature is that you can create, you can say, uh, based on this interview, let's say the, the interview that I talked about with my daughters on Is It Okay to Lie? You plug in the transcript into uh, ChatGPT. Then you say, create a game. And again, you can give whatever parameters you want to, an exciting game. Uh, what would the game look like? And you type in the parameters of what you think the game, game could like look like. And then ChatGPT will actually generate a game for you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so thank you for mentioning that. I don't know if any specific AI technologies by themselves create games. But again, using, for example, chat GPT along with an AI voice generator, I think are really cool tools. So uh, I'm going to kind of end my presentation uh, today. Uh, thank you very much for coming. I just wanted to point out that uh, next week I will be interviewing Jaime Ankahima uh, from Peru. We're going to be talking about online professional development. He has done amazing work over the last few years and bringing voices together so that people can share their ideas, expand upon their ideas. I think this is allows people from around the world to deeply engage with uh, other teachers and other students. And I think that's a wonderful work. The broadcast is gonna be next uh, Sunday at the same time, nine o'clock, and I'll be posting more information and the questions that we're going to be discussing on that broadcast as well. So I want to thank you very much for joining the broadcast today. Uh, again, uh, focusing on to how to use different technologies, again, behind the curtain. And who knows what is coming this year? It's kind of like when I started my website 20, now 26 years ago, I had no idea I would still be sitting, engaging in this type of way. And so I look forward to visiting with you again on a future broadcast. And I encourage you to uh, keep sharing, keep sharing different ideas that are coming up. 
engaging and changing the way that you think you view things. And thank you, Jaime, very much. Um, so again, I hope to see you on a future broadcast and have a wonderful day.